if you develop the perception, the public perception of architectural practices to be a welcoming and supportive environment, you will attract more talent. Episode 145. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I am speaking to the fabulous Stephen Drew, who is the founder of the Architecture Social, which is an online platform which is filled with fabulous content, resources and tools to help young architects and old architects find new jobs and stand out from the crowd. Uh, it's quite a brilliant uh, initiative that Stephen discusses in this episode, how he came up with the idea and how he has been nurturing that platform. Um, this interview was actually recorded at the beginning of this year, so around about February time, and we were still in the depths of lockdown. And uh, I know Architecture Social was one of Stephen's lockdown projects. Now, Stephen himself is trained as an architect. He has a degree in architecture and his part two from Manchester School of Architecture. He then worked in practice for a while, um, uh, but found himself moving towards the recruitment consultant world, uh, something that fits very much with his personality. And he documents uh, in this conversation how that transition occurred and what his current positions have been. Currently today, he is the head of talent at, at Croyd Lowry, um, and he is involved in helping architecture practices find the best talent possible. So sit back, relax and enjoy the fabulous Stephen Drew. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Stephen, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. How are you? I'm living the dream, the, the <laughs> coronavirus dream, but it's starting to be less of a nightmare and there's a bit of light at the end of the tunnel, hopefully. How's, how's your lockdown been? How's lockdown part three been going for you? Uh, it's been all right. Well, I started a diet and then it's gone a bit topsy-turvy, but I've, my Peloton's coming next week, Rian. So by the time this podcast is out, I'm going to be putting my headphones on listening to it. So. Nice one. You'll be you'll be broadcasting uh, podcasts yourself or live streaming from the Peloton. That's it. So I haven't we seen do that an, before. If we do another one down the line, it'll be the before and after. And hopefully this is the before, do you know what I'm saying? And we'll get the after <laughs> later. Love it. Love it. Well, welcome. Welcome to the show. You are the founder of the Architecture Social, and we'll get on to mm -hmm. what that is. You're head of um, architecture in, uh, at McDonald and Company. You're mm -hmm. currently, you're, you know, that's a, a recruitment agency. You've got a background in architecture. Uh, yeah. You've done, you did your, your master's at the at Manchester School of Architecture one of my favorite schools in the country, one of the most switched on schools in the country, particularly in terms of its business education. So, you know, people Oof. like Rob Hyde and yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Fantastic. And you were at Westminster for your, for your degree. So the, the first, and this, this podcast, we're going to be discussing like how you are disrupting recruitment. So Ooh. why don't we jump in and first of all, yeah, give us a little bit of background about your story and the architecture social. Sure, Ian. So basically, I guess I was a little bit of a black sheep in architecture. I do love architecture. I was in architecture, but in the architectural practice, I was the cheeky chap who basically, so uh, where I used to work at EPR Architects, you had free kitchens, okay? So I would do my do a bit of my work, and then I would go for a wander and wander to the kitchens, and then my boss would be like trying to track me down in which kitchen I was to do the work. Like, Stephen, come on back. And the thing is, is because I really loved talking. I really loved... I, I, the front end stuff, I really love 3D modeling, but when you give me a technical detail, my passion wasn't there. I respect it, yeah. I respect the art of it, it just wasn't for me. And at the time, I left EPR Architects, uh, so a traditional part two job. They were very, very good employers, and I went into recruitment. I kind of had like my Breaking Bad moment. I was like, do you know what? I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna experiment. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go there, and I'm gonna. Um, you went to the dark side. Totally went to the dark side, and 
and uh, having that conversation, my parents were really supportive, but imagine you're like, okay, so I'm not going to become an architect. I'm going to become a recruitment consultant. So everyone's just like, what are you doing? You've lost your brain. And um, I, I bespoke with goods. And it was nice to be involved in recruitment, which was architectural related. And I like that talking aspect. Mm. There is definitely with recruitment. Okay. How, 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 how did you, why recruitment of all the things and how did, cause that's actually quite a, it's quite an intelligent bit of self-awareness to know. Cause I mean, you know, I, I know lots of architects who perhaps have got a personality, which is much more people based and they want to be speaking and an architecture office typically doesn't give you that opportunity. So how did you know that recruitment was the, the, the direction to go in? Good question. I, I guess maybe there was like a subliminal part because there's an element of a recruitment consultant. And I think the name of recruitment consultant, uh, some people have had good experiences, but a lot of people have had bad experiences. It's a bit like an estate agent. If you mention a, a dinner party or a recruitment consultant, people are like, uh-oh, here it goes, right? It's one of them moments of like, oh no, here we go. It's <laughs> recruitment. He's going to ask me about this and that. And um, I guess there was an element where I was just, I would think there was two parts and uh, being truthful is one that I like talking and it seemed not, I wouldn't quite say taboo, but it was just super unconventional to a uh, traditional architecture role. And there was the idea of money because um, mm. as we know, I had a lot of debt at the time. I had a really fair salary with um, EPR, EPR architects as a part two, but I just felt like missing out. And the idea of going and doing something and the idea of making money was appealing at the time to pay off my debt and do all this stuff. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there was a romantic notion of, oh, I'm just going to do it and let's have a bit of fun. But obviously I work in architecture, right? So there's two sides to recruitment, right? You can literally, it depends how much of a, a soul you've got, I guess. And if you've got a soul in recruitment, you're going to do the right thing. And if you haven't got a soul, you're going to put those people into jobs. There's going to be a bit of disasters, but you're going to make a lot of money, right? <laughs> and you're going to make a lot of money. Unfortunately, I have a soul. So I've made some money, some good money, but not the huge amounts. There's one or two people I know in recruitment who literally, they'll have the Jeep, they have a boat, they have everything. And I'm the guy there who's like, I don't have a boat. You can see my flat here. It's a nice flat, but it's like there's no boat, no Jeep, and this is bought and shared ownership. Do you know what I'm saying? So great scheme, but uh, I do up at night, and, and, I, and that's the important thing. Like to me, my reputation in the industry is important. Um, right. Yeah. So, so that's how I went to recruitment is because I didn't quite feel involved. I didn't feel like I was the right fit for the traditional part two. And, you know, with even part three, I kept kind of putting it off. People would say to me, you know, when are you doing it? And I'd be like, oh, yeah, I'm going to look at it next, you know, I'll look at it next year and all this stuff. So I was like the, the meandering part two. And, and um, in the end, recruitment worked out. And that's how I got into it, really. Got it. Okay. So you, so you didn't go, you didn't go back to architecture at all at any point. You didn't. I uh, know. I mean, I have a friend called Ryan Holland, who's an associate um, at Soda Architects and he always teases me and says, you're going to return to architecture. And I'm like, dude, I, you know, I mean, I w trained up in Revit, but that was 2014. Do you know what I'm saying? I'm going to be there. I, the only thing I can do right now is use a phone and use um, Outlook, but who knows, maybe one day, right. It would be quite nice to go back to design. So, so, so explain to me, what does a recruiter do for an architecture practice? How does it, how does it work? And, okay. and then we can talk about the broader subject of how, how it needs and can be disrupted. Okay. So as and, my and, dad and, and perhaps we can talk about, you, you, you highlighted there some of the, some of the problems that people typically face with recruitment. Yeah. Okay. So my dad actually calls recruitment a necessary evil. Okay. So that's what my dad's <laughs> job description is what I do. And, uh, and, and I think the, the problem is with recruitment is that it's a very people orientated process. It's the blessing and the burden. So the, if you think about recruitment, you've got your own architectural practice right now, and you're busy building buildings, you're busy doing what you're doing. And part of that relies on having a great team, having uh, the people to build the buildings. And actually finding people is a super time consuming thing as a yeah. business owner. Sometimes you can get lucky. Um, sometimes a lot of it can be due to your perception in the industry. If you build up an excellent brand over the years, you're going to get more people applying. But every now and then you'll have a really tricky role or something. Say now you suddenly need a BIM manager. You, you, you have none. 
you, you've been running like AutoCAD and MicroStation for years and you're thinking, how do I do this? How do I know how good a BIM manager is? How do I do it? And, yeah. and so a good recruitment consultant out there, and there are a few of them, hopefully, I'd like to be classed as one of them, but you, the idea is good recruitment consultant will go into the business, help out, meet you and understand the business and go, right, you need X, Y, Z. There's a lot of trust in this, though, because if I didn't care about you, I could say, yeah, you need this. And this is where the problem right. comes with recruitment is that a lot of it is about someone understanding the market and uh, them, again, weighing up uh, how much of a soul they have. So a good recruitment <laughs> consultant will go and give honest opinion, offer a lot of value yeah. and listen to the business and follow you throughout your career, follow you throughout the business and come in and help out on certain times. But the problem is, is that the whole problem, the whole recruitment process can be quite messy and be quite difficult. And from a candidate's perspective, there's a massive misconception of what recruitment consultants is. Some people feel like they just send a CV, you're going to magically find them a job. And the reality is a recruitment consultant is always working for an architectural practice, the client, and they're always going to be offering information which is relevant to the role that they're working on. If you're a part one architectural assistant in the UK, mm. I, I, there's so many so many amazing part ones I see who send a CV to an, a recruitment consultant, and I feel like saying that is the wrong thing to do. You should a recruitment consultant is going to be busy chasing these tricky requirements such as BIM managers recruitment consultants uh, because we have to realize that they get paid when they find the right person for the role. So it's really important to understand what a recruitment consultant is. So to me, a recruitment consultant for, uh, basically helps an architectural practice solve a problem. Right. And, and that's the important distinction that you, uh, a recruitment consultant gets paid by the architectural practice. Therefore, they're solving the architectural practices problems, it's not as candidate focused as some people like it to believe. Ah, interesting. So, so in terms of like approaching recruitment agencies, you're saying that we, how, well, obviously how do you, how do you interface them with the candidates? Well, there's two things. So there's kind of like the, what's been really interesting is, so there's this, you, obviously you do want to keep a really good perception and you do want to understand the market and you do want to meet people. And sometimes you'll meet someone and you'll be like, you're an amazing, I've got to get you in front of the right people. Mm. But the reality is, I think that that's a little bit of, um, uh, uh, I want to say like Wizard of Oz, Rian, right? Like it's not as magical as it seems. And sometimes I think personally, that some um, recruitment consultants give uh, or agencies out there will go, I know everyone, we'll find you the job. And what most people find is that that falls down really quickly because what happens behind the scenes is that um, that candidate can be introduced to one or two architectural practices, but they're not introduced to everyone. And then what, what you'll find is that the recruitment consultant at the start is like, I'm going to get you a job and painted you that wizard of Oz. And then what happens on the line? nothing happens. And mm. then two to three weeks, the person's frustrated and they've gone, this person said X, Y, Z, and I still haven't found a job. And that's because it's unrealistic. It's unrealistic to think that a recruitment agency or a recruitment consultant knows everyone. A recruitment consultant is normally working on the specific roles that are in front of them. And that right. is the big myth. And, the, and I'm amazed that a lot of recruitment consultants are too scared to talk about how the business works because they're worried then that, suddenly uh, candidates are going to realize that they can't find the magical job for them all the time and they're never going to contact them again. And I'm like, that's not how it works. If you're actually the opposite and if you're open about the fact that you're only working on one or two particular roles, mm. that it's going to be a lot easier. And so that's what I found at the moment. And it's really bizarre. So recruiting during the pandemic is I've got, of course, I get lots of CVs. Last night I had a, a beautiful email from a part one saying i've got my cv and portfolio i would love feedback and and i have to be really up front and say um i'm not the best person to contact right now i don't have a part one role however you can join the architecture social or find resources out there where you're going to get a lot of help in the community but i can't sit down on one-on-one -on -one and then help you and i think that that's better than not replying but do you yeah. get what i mean whereas before 
I wouldn't, it's almost the temptation is to say nothing and then to be, and then what happens is, is that person, then they feel unloved, they feel uncontacted and they feel that I haven't helped them. Yeah. So I, I think that there's a lot of miscommunication in recruitment or um, I think that the because of the process is so, there's so many moving parts that yeah. it's not talked about. And I mean, no one talks about how the fact of a recruitment consultant gets paid. So the only people that know about it are the architectural recruitment businesses who then will say, oh, it's too expensive or whatever. And no one as a candidate knows how it works at all. How do, how, I mean, think about it. There's all these recruitment consult, uh, age companies out there, right? How do they get paid? No architectural candidate thinks about it. They just send yeah. the CV off. But they get paid because you've got these companies which are prepared to pay them from an introduction, right? But it's like it's like it's like it's almost a bit like are, 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 are there are there models where it's flipped where the candidate pays the recruitment agency to find them a job? Does that exist anywhere? Or is that not doesn't exist to my awareness? doesn't exist that would be interesting um but then and this is a really int that's that's a good point that you're at and this is one of the things that because i think that there's a value in mentoring where actually you pay for the mentoring or you pay for the consultancy and you know that that person's unbiased but mm. you hit the nail on the head because if you go to a recruitment consultant in some shape or form they will help you out and i think good recruitment consultants will help you out but you've got to realize that a lot of the advice that they can offer is in relation to the jobs they're working on. Yeah. So if you're a BIM manager and I've got a few BIM manager roles, I can offer you loads and loads of and loads of advice. But if you're a part one or part two, it's not in my immediate interest to help because I'm not being paid for it. So you do want to help, but you see that there's this big, yes. this big problem. And that's why a lot of people feel unloved by recruitment consultants because they either go like, I've been ignored and da da da. And quite rightly, because they have been ignored or they've been frustrated or let down or go, I got to first stage in a booth and I heard nothing. And not all the time is it the recruitment consultant's fault. It's because maybe the practice has changed their mind and all this stuff, but there's a lot of moving parts. And this is why there's so much frustration here. Got it, got it. And I mean, we're just getting to the tip of the iceberg, but you get what I mean? There's so many, there's so how, many things. How, how, so how does the recruitment agency's fees work in terms of actually finding the candidate then? Is it just a one-time payment for an introduction fee that the, that the architecture practice pays for? Or if you're contracting, does the recruitment agency always take a little, a little something off the, off the yeah. salary? How does, yeah, it, so how, do, how does it work? Two, there's two ways. So you'd have what's called a permanent introduction and a temporary or a, a contractor. And right. so there's two complete models. So the first one's a permanent introduction. So, I mean, you're, you run an architectural practice. Say now you brief me to find an architect. Say now their salary is 40,000 pounds. Okay. There's a percentage that we agree yep. that I get paid for the introduction. So that typically in the UK is... Um, it's a bit like fees in architectural practice. It's kind of, the, and, and again, for any architectural businesses out here, um, if you drive a recruitment consultant down on the fees, in one sense, it's a victory because, hey, you're going to pay less. But the truth is, you're on the bottom of the pile, right? It's like fees. <laughs> it's like it's like architectural recruitment fees. You pay me a good fee, I can spend, do a lot of time. I can go and find you that person you're looking for. Yeah. You pay me lower fees, I will give it to the equivalent of the part one on my team. And maybe you'll get something, maybe you won't. And yeah. then you're going to be frustrated and be like, well, Steve, you didn't find me anyone. And I'm like, you know, on that fee, I can't, I can't meet anyone. I can't do anything. Yes. So, yeah, so a, a good recruitment fee. I mean, if you paid me 20% of the introduction, that means you can go out, you can canvas, you can find the role. And so when I say 20%, say no, you're paying, you want to pay an Arctic 40,000 pounds. I'm saying that there would be 8,000 pounds for the introduction because that's how much recruitment costs. Right. So you can get me down to 12%, where, you, you know, in theory, you can. Yeah. And like I say to everyone, I will work at any fee, but for you, you're literally then, it's, it's, like the, it's like the analogy of, uh, saying you're going to do a big architectural uh, project. And in reality, you tell the client you've got a big um, team on it. And really, you've got the part one in the office and you'll go to the meeting. But really, part one's doing all the legwork. And you can see how sketchy that is. So, 
So that's what that's a permanent uh, how a permanent fee works. And then there's a rebate uh, period, and a rebate period is like um, a warranty period, right? right. Which is which Where is it's a not, whole. It's, it's not a fit, and you're like, take this person yeah. back. <laughs> well, it's a it's a yeah, but it's a, it's a super messy thing because you have to look at it from both sides of the coin, right? Because it's a human process. I've had it before where I found someone and truthfully, there could be um, the culture's not right in the architectural practice, or maybe we know in real life, it's not all perfect places. You've got, every place is not perfect in life, right? But I'm sure there's some, that will be hypothetical. So we're going to say Ren, that your architectural practice is great, but your friend's architectural practice is bigger. And one of the team leaders, he's a really nice guy, but he's a bit difficult to work with. Right. And people go to his team and people leave. And this can happen in the rebate periods uh, of, yes. of the time. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of because it's a human pro- problem. How do you do a warranty or a rebate period when the candidate might change their mind because they, it might not be the right fit? That's no one's fault. Mm-hmm. Um, it could be that you, you as a business, change. You've, you, coronavirus comes and you've got to let people go. Yeah. Um, you know. Or the other thing is that the recruitment consultant misled the candidate. I mean, that can happen as well. So it's important to have a rebate. But what I'm saying is, over the three months, so many things happen, and it's really hard at the end of it then to say, "Yeah, I've had this guy for three months, and he's been working on my project for three months, but now I want." Uh, for refund and I'm like whoa you haven't contacted me for three months what's going on and are you sure that you know and I can speak to the candidate and they can say something totally different so it's a really really messy oh right uh, Gosh, yeah it, it's a really really difficult thing but to bring it back to a recruitment fee it sounds like a lot thousands of pounds but if you think about it from a, a, a mechanics point of view if I'm sat down as like an architect billable per hour mm. and I have a team underneath me these thousands slowly it turns into the equivalent of 10 20 pound per hour because if I'm working for ages on these roles I'm finding you the right person by the time I get um, a fee that eight thousand pound I've spent a month doing it with yeah. my team so I mean- suddenly and, and and obviously, you know, from a business perspective, from an employer's perspective, like this is a this is one of the this is the biggest investment you make in your business is your is your HR is your people, mm. and getting the right getting the right candidate or getting the right person for the job ultimately that's going to be the most profitable thing for your business. So yeah, in in the context and also in the lifetime value of having the right person for the job, kind of starts to make the the upfront fee well it just makes sense it starts to make sense. Yeah, if you've got if you want a project right now, say now you're doing this massive um, housing scheme, you don't have the right skill set. Actually, to get me on board to find the right person, it's going to save you time because the bit about recruitment where it all goes wrong is that one one hand you can be like, I'm not paying Stephen a few thousand pounds just to send over a CV, and and it one's and in, on one hand you'd feel comp- that is a completely logical thing to yeah. think until you realize that you finding someone actually stops you working. You have to go through the CVs, which takes ages, and then you have to find the right person. Then you invite them in for an interview. Then you get an hour of your time, and it was the right fit it was. And then you go through the process. Then you've got to do the, um, make an offer, a counter offer. And before you know it, you've spent two to three days of your week doing this. So that's, say now your rate is three, four hundred pounds a day. You've mm-hmm. already spent a grand, and suddenly the candidate doesn't want to go to you because they've taken a job at Gensler. <laughs> Right, and you're like, ah, oh, here we go again. And so suddenly, this the introduction to an architectural recruitment consultant isn't so bad, but it shouldn't. Recruitment is to go back to my dad is needed if it's done the right way. The the thing is, we just got to remember, it's um, it's a human process, mm. and I do, but I do think though that there are a few things that um, employers can do to make the whole process more efficient. So I'm happy to talk about them as a few tips now, if you want to. Yeah, absolutely, please. Okay. So the biggest misconception, first of all, is driving the fees down and using loads of recruitment consultants. So if you think about it now, you've hired, you have an office manager who's doing recruitment called Deborah, right? And so every architectural um, recruitment consultant rings up, Deborah deals with them. And so Deborah's driven down the fees. She goes, don't worry, Ryan, I've got the fees down. And you're like, nice one, Deborah. And you've got loads of recruitment consultants. 
Okay. So the biggest problem in, in, in here is that suddenly loads of recruitment consultants are working on a low fee on your role. So what actually happens? They plaster the job description everywhere. They speak to everyone, but because you've decided to get loads of recruitment consultants, they're all going to be competing for the fee because the way it works in recruitment is the first email that gets put across gets the fee. So what happens then is that everyone is racing to send Deborah, the practice manager, the CV. Okay. So say now I'm, one of these recruitment consultants working, I'll find someone's CV, and I'll get them on. I'll, I'll get them on the phone, and I'll be like, "Right, I've got a race. I've got a race to get the CV across." So what happens? This whole salute um, scenario that we've created is now the temptation is just to get this person's CV across. So mm. unfortunately, what happens is bad bad practices manifest. Um, there's no time to meet the candidate. There's no time to really qualify the candidate because suddenly now I'm worried about getting the CV first. And yeah. so Deborah will have the CV thrown across to her straight away. And the salary is going to be a rough guess because I spoke to the candidate. I am really fleshed it out. The candidate will be put across for 37,000. Mm. Then another agent will put it across. And then another agent might even just see the CV on CV library and completely breach GDPR and send it over. So the biggest, do you know what I mean? Which is completely illegal and has happened. Now, before any recruitment consultant listens to this and goes, Steve, you can't say this as a general sweeping statement. I'm not saying every recruitment consultant does this, but I've seen lots of do it. Yeah. Um, because I've competed a lot against it. And I will, I once or twice have sent a, a candidate across and then the CV has been sent half an hour ago. And I'm like, I was just on the phone with this. I met this guy. I was just on the phone, got his permission. And the CV's across. So the best thing to do as an architectural practice is not have a lot of recruitment consultants. Plus you don't want everyone ringing you up, everyone ringing Deborah up every day going, hi, yeah, you know, it's going gonna, gonna, it's gonna to completely ruin um, her day because she's going to be consumed. So tip number one, don't use loads of recruitment consultants. Tip number two, don't drive the fee down. Um, talk about the different services that people can offer on the fee. So say like, look, at 12%, what are you doing? At 15%, what are you doing? At 18%, what are you doing? And, you know, if, if I'm going out to the market and I'm doing a huge search or if, you, if it's like a tailored approach, which is like, um, not quite headhunting, but say, no, you've got to like, you've got to research a BIM manager. You've got to do an exercise and you want to report and you want to benchmark salaries. Maybe it would be 25% then, but you're getting a lot of market intel for it. So mm. tip number two, when you're speaking to a recruitment consultant, qualify how much they're going to be doing in terms of the job for the fee. Right. And, the, and the third thing is, I like the way you interview a candidate, interview the recruitment consultant. And make them come to your office. If a recruitment consultant doesn't want to come to your architectural practice, how are they going to know what the culture is? How are they going to know who's the right fit? So make sure that they come. But then that's also on you to be able to give them time. And there's a, you've got to be a little bit open to a recruitment consultant. Yeah. Okay, don't chop their head off straight away when they go through the door. Just give them like a little chance. And, and then you see what happens. But those are the three tips. So let the recruitment consultant get involved to see the architectural practice and qualify how much they're going to do for their fee. And then in terms of how you go about it, don't drive down the fee straight away and don't use hundreds of recruitment consultants. Cherry pick the ones that you believe could be a good fit, whether they're ex-industry or they've got a good reputation. Mm. Meet them, have a frank conversation, and then see how it works from there. Got it. So it's, it's, it's much more about being specific, working with less rather than more yeah. and finding the one that's the right fit and, and evaluating what's involved in the services rather than trying to play the volume game, if you like. Yeah. Volume game, you could get lucky, but I guarantee you, yeah, your, your Deborah, who's your practice manager, is going to be super stressed out. Everyone's going to be trying to ring her up and she'll be um, getting multiple copies of the same CV. Got it. Got it. And they're not even properly qualified necessarily. Probably not. Yeah. So and so so tell me about how how the contracting fees work. Oh yeah. So there is a charge on top, right? That's true. So permanent was a straight up introduction cost. Right. So, so, so that's a one off fee and it's based as a percentage of the annual salary of the candidate. Bingo, you got it. Got it. So a contracting is a bit different because 
So in theory, so say now at um, a McDonald's company, we're quite good with contractors. We do all the compliance, but it's very, very different. So if you want a contractor for a recruitment agency or consultancy, um, it's the contract is set up actually not between, so you know, the architect is called David Jones, right? Mm. The contract isn't with you and David Jones and I'm just an introduction man. The contract is between you and my recruitment consultancy. And the person who's acting on behalf of the recruitment consultancy is David Jones. And so well, the way it sets up is saying now it was £30 per hour, me and you agree. Mm-hmm. I've got an agreement with David Jones that I'm paying him £25 per hour. I'm making all this up on yep, the spot. Yep. But then there's a £5 margin. And in that £5 man- margin, we process our accountants. The, uh, the recruitment consultant gets a fee. Um, from that as well so yes uh, there is a fee on top the the bit that is important to bear in mind again it's down to how human everyone is so on one hand if i haven't got a soul i can totally skim on top of the architect but that's super short term because what happens in your architectural practice david johns can ask you and go how much you paying steve right? And you go off oh, £80 an hour and you'd be like, what? Did so it's really important to always be super transparent because if I was saying that I was charging you £40 an hour, you're thinking, oh my gosh, that's so much money. And then I've got, and then I've got, and then I'm paying David 25 And then suddenly you two both work out that I've been taking 15. What's going to happen? You're never going to work with me again. And David's going to quit. So, so that is the truth. That's how it works. But a sensible margin there is probably between, oof, I reckon it depends. It's, you need to cover a certain amount of pounds per hour to keep the yep. overheads and everything. But you can't um, take the mickey. I was going to swear then, but you can't. Is, is there limits to how long then you can have someone on your books contracting or is it kind of indefinite? And what happens, what happens if the employer wants to take the contractor on as a permanent member of staff? Uh, if you is, start, is, there like, is there like buyout fees or? It's a buyout fee. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So there is a buyout fee uh, for it. So it's what's called temp to permanent. Um, and then you, that releases the person from the contract. Normally, if you have quite a human uh, conversation with the recruitment consultant, I'm sure you'll get a bit of a discount, especially if the contract's gone on for a long period. But if they've been contracting for a month and then you want to take someone on permanent, you know, there has to be a fee that kind of is in line with it. And to answer your other question, uh, you mentioned what happens if people work for a long time. You have to be really careful, especially now with IO35 and tax, things have changed. So I think it's going to be really, there's going to be a lot less contractors now in the UK because of IO35. Because before, what it means is that someone running their own company could... Uh, set up a, a limited company in the way which was more tax efficient. Yes. Now it's less tax efficient. And what it means is that the government has gone, well, well we're going to have more tax on that. But the problem is now, why would you be a contractor when you have less benefits, less everything, and it's not that tax efficient? So I imagine soon we're going to have a very shortage, a good shortage of um, um, contractors in the UK, which are good because I've advised those are contractors. Well, why would you just go permanent now? You can have a pension, you can have mm. holidays, you can have benefits. Well, is it is it the? I mean, I remember when I was starting out my architectural career, I contracted pretty much for the first four or five years, basically. Mm. In fact, I was always on a I was always on some kind of contract. And that was because it was two thousand and eight, and the companies weren't giving out permanent contracts or I worked at, I was contracting at Grimshaw for a bit and then, but I wasn't doing it for a recruitment agency. I was doing it through them directly. So yeah. there wasn't any kind of cost involved in like a, in a buyout fee, but um, that, that it, is that still the, the case that there's a lot just because of the, un, the kind of economic uncertainty that it leads to people not necessarily wanting to be contractors, but they're kind of doing it because it gives the businesses um, that flexibility. If they need to reduce staff, then the contractors are, you know, the first ones to go, if you like. 
Yeah, I think that with contracting, it's it, it relies on the company and the company style. So there's a few, um, there's one or two large architectural practices in the UK, which use quite a lot of contractors. It would be interesting to see if they still do that. But you're right, you mentioned your Grimshaw scenario. A good example of a contractor is that I have a really good client and they were, they were initially looking for someone for three months. And yeah. so what was great is that actually there were a lot of Revit students, you know, like BIM whizzes that joined and actually they did really well. And so that three months then turns into a six months and then turns into a nine months. And I will be having conversations with them about then going, you want to talk to your line manager now about going permanent if you love the practice so much. And so there's been a good few examples where um, that person then goes permanent, but you're right. I've seen other examples where, um, people will work like nine, 10 months, 12 months, and then the contract ends. And it could be that the project comes to an end. So it, it really, really is mixed. And I think like a good a good recruitment consultant, well, it, it can work other ways where, I, like for instance, there was a fantastic architectural technician. And I remember I was looking for this big client for someone who could jump on board, do Revit and residential. And so he had worked in elderly homes and he was Revit. And I met him and he was such a sweet guy. And I was like, how much are you looking for? And he was like, oh, I'll get like 22K, 22,000 equivalent, you know, 15 pound an hour. And I was like, you were totally underselling yourself. So in the end, we got him 35,000, you know, a really nice rate. He was super happy. He was saying to his, his friends, then I'm working at a big architectural practice with a big rate. But that was the point. He was really happy with it. So he was happy there. He worked really hard. He worked a, a, a long period of time. And in the end, he went permanent. But what I'm saying is there was a chance there to put him in at a lower rate, yeah. but it's super short term. So actually by giving him a fair rate, so the client was happy with, I give him a generous salary. He was there a long time. Yeah. And, you know, actually in terms of what I do, I had a decent um, cut as well, but that was because the rate was engineered in a way that was the client was happy with it. He delivered, he got above what way above what he was expecting. And then there was a still a margin then. So it, contracting can work. Um, it can be a, a lot of fuss to set up and you've got timesheets and you know all this. Yeah, yeah. But it's a, it's a very important system. And the reason why it's set up is that if, for instance, the contractor makes a mistake, you could sue me <laughs> instead of the contractor because the contract's between me and you. So there's a reason why there's so much legal work procedures and why people get paid per week. I've also had it, by the way, where... Um, we had a contractor last year at a company for a month or two and the company went bust. And um, so I still paid the contractor, but um, and me as a business, we inherited like 13,000 pounds with a debt. So it could go the other way where actually I lost like 13,000 pounds. Can you imagine that? It was a bad day at work. It's like, I felt like the guy in the stock market. I was like, oh no. And the, you know, the candidate by saying was like, Oh, am I going to get paid? And I was like, absolutely. You'll get paid. And then, you know, I right. Got it. So it's so basically the business went bust. They, you had a contract with the contractor essentially for X amount of months and you had to, yeah, I had to, I had to pay that. his salary. And then um, I had to line up with the debt collector to get mine from the architectural practice. And meanwhile, that I was no chance because at the time, and I, I'm not going to say the name of the company out of respect, yeah. but they were very naughty because they had been dipping into everyone's pensions and everything. Oh. And this is an architectural practice and didn't pay them. And so there was no chance I was going to get paid because you had employees, which were not going to get pensions, not going to get uh, remuneration. So, hey, that's just part of the risk of it all. But the point is I learned a lesson. And so what I'm saying is when contracting is lucrative contracting can be lucrative but you really got to know what you're doing otherwise you're gonna you, uh, stuff like that can happen where i i got stung as the agent because the responsible thing to do is pay the, i'm not gonna not pay the mm. architectural um you know the the architectural designer who's doing the job so there you go and and, and some of the some of the you know some of the, the cons if you like of contracting for 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 both the candidate and the employer what would they be candidate you've kind of got less security haven't yeah. you because you can be let go at a, a week's notice that can also be a blessing because you oh, can yeah. be like hey <laughs> see you later i'm off and they're like no and you're like 
It's in the contract, dude. So it's a blessing and a burden. I think that um, before you could make a lot of money doing it because if you were clever in the way you set up a business in the UK as a contractor, you could make it so tax efficient that you were basically paying less tax. Um, you weren't doing anything illegal. You could just structure it that way. It was a trade-off of, of not having a permanent job. But now I think that there's a lot less risk. So, I mean, um, sorry, there's a lot more... Uh, there's a lot less money you can make and there's a lot less, there's a lot more you sacrifice. So personally, I think that contracting can be great if you're in between things and you want to see like a new culture and you want to experience things. Um, or like you said, it can be a good way to get in the door with with a grim short or anything because yeah. you kind of join at that project. And truthfully, in my experience of contractors is, is that if you're a good contractor, they will keep you longer. And also, if you make a good um, impression, usually you stick around. That's the truth. Um, so it's a really great way to get in the door. And yeah. so anyone now during the pandemic that is kind of, is is a jobs is a job seeker, then you know being open to a contract, especially if you haven't got a job right now, um, makes complete sense. But then one of the downsides for employers is you can't attract someone for, uh, from who's on a month's notice to do your three month contract with one week's notice. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's not gonna, it's not gonna work. So I've had that scenario pop up lately, and I'm like, no, we're never gonna find someone on a month's notice. Just forget it. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So it's like, why would you leave? So like, oh yeah, I'll pack up my permanent job for a contract, and then said no one. So so tell me a little bit about how you're disrupting the recruitment industry what are the what are the sorts of things that need disruption well this model there's two things it's all got to change it's, it's all got to change <laughs> it's um i think there's always a place for a good recruitment consultant because there will always be like we used the analogy before a bid manager you need someone strategic you need someone to help you with that so there'll always be that um that expertise on, on that area will always be needed. What we don't need anymore is this old kind of model, this old, as some people call it, a bum fight to get the CV over. So many recruitment consultants in the field, which are not specialists are not dedicated, you know, someone that's kind of dipped in with a degree in another career and it's just, you have to make the money, you know, Wolf of Wall Street, woo! You know, like, hey! that's gonna That's going to change. I mean, it's fine having a bit of fun, but you know, people's lives are there. You know, it's like when I say... So just add on that, do you guys tend to get paid like on commission basis? Like as a as a recruitment consultant, do you have like a base salary and then a commission? Yeah, yeah, of course. So, yeah. Salary, so your salary is not, you're, it's not capped necessarily. No. So, I mean, in theory, a recruitment consultant, um, like my base is, um, is quite low comparatively, but it's, so it's a blessing on the burden because it's a bit like the contractor scenarios. In one hand, I've got less security. But on the other hand, uh, if you make a lot of sales, you can, in theory, go up. So unfortunately, I am still living in Lewisham. So, uh, you know, I'm not there, uh, yeah, the, the, grab the money and go. But the, the bit that I've got going is that is that I have a very low fallout rate. And the reason for that is that I am now, because of the amount of experience I've got, is that I see now you were looking Sometimes I go, I don't think that this practice is the right one for you. Or yeah. sometimes I will tell, people will call up about the job and I'll say, this is the architecture practice, but I really don't think we should go for it. I don't think it's the right fit for you. And now because I've got experience enough with clients as well, at first I used to be enamored by architectural practices. So say now I was working with, um, I don't know, who do I work with? I've worked with some great companies like we mentioned Grimshaw before. You're right. You mentioned Grimshaw. I've worked with them in the past. At first, you're like, ah, oh, Grimshaw, because I used to be a part two, you know. Ah. So unfortunately, then when I would be speaking with Grimshaw, if they say, oh, I should do this or that, I'd be like, ah, oh, yes, because I love them, right? But the problem is, is that I learned now is that sometimes I have to challenge them for their own good. Right. I'm like, you need to make a decision sooner because you're going to lose the candidate. Or you need to um, look at this person because I know the CV isn't the one that pops, but I've met them and I think they're amazing. I really think you'd like them. And so from building rapport, there's a few clients I've got and they go, oh, I'll take your word for it. And they go, I love that guy. We're going to offer him, you know, and that's because yeah. over the years you build rapport. Um, and they, I guess that's one of the things that I enjoy. That's the bit when recruitment works, 
it's worth its weight in gold. Yeah. Me and you work together for a long time. I know the architectural practice and uh, I know what you like. I know the kind, and then I see someone, I speak to them and I go, you know, it's a fit. You're like, I'll be like, yeah, you know who you'd love working with. It's, uh, it's Rian over here. And you'd be like, I know you were thinking of this and that, but right now you've been working long hours for years and years and years in a big company. Okay. This is a smaller architectural practice. Okay. So the website's not quite where you're used to, you know, we haven't got like Richard Rogers thing swooping down, but I'm like, think about where you're working, right? It's going to be a really nice place to work. I know them. You're going to work. You're not going to be working long. At, actually, Richard Rogers are really good. So, but what I'm saying yeah, is. No, I worked there as well. That was, they were lovely. Yeah. Do you know what I say to people, right? With Richard Rogers, I never get a CV from Richard Rogers because the only people that leave Richard Rogers is when they quit architecture or they die because they're such a good <laughs> employer. Right. But let's pretend there's an architectural practice, which works people into the uh, grave, long hours, all this stuff. Right. You've been working there. I would say, don't go for another one like that. Don't go to that. Go to a place that's going to look after you. You've got a kid on the way. You live around here. You work for Rian. You're going to work nine for six. You'll do a late night once in a while, but you'll want to do it because you get along with him. That's the kind of thing that, that works. And so having that conversation, having that insight really helps in terms of recruitment so how do you disrupt them so the bit that, that i'm interested in disrupting is so all the negative bits we talked about right we want to yeah. get rid of the bum fight we want to get rid of people not um being truthful and i think that everyone in recruitment has got to elevate their game to stand out so you've got to do the things you're not comfortable with you've got to go online you've got to do live streams you've got to do podcasts you've got to talk about the financials involved so the people that do this immediately are going to survive and so the the bit that like let's get the horn in the camera so if you're an architectural client i want you to take on board what i said and if you're not doing it you're not going to help disrupt the recruitment industry but the other bit that i think was going to is needs to disrupt in, in recruitment is the age old job boards the age old way of going about recruitment the age old jobs that are written in a condescending way you know we are looking for someone with 10 years experience da, 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 da. that's not going to attract the candidates anymore so what i think is going to disrupt the recruitment business is more transparency from everyone. And so one of the things that I really enjoy about the architectural social community, which I set up is that, so for any architectural practices out there, you can post a job online now for free, okay? Now, whether you get people apply or not, that's different, but I've given you the platform to do it for free. There's no charge there. And you yeah. can, as of now as well, you, so you can go into the community and you've seen it. It's a bit like a forum. You know, There's lots of cool things happening there. We've got um, Dungeons and Dragons next week, by the way. So it's a totally social place. You can do all this stuff, but there's a space where you can put a job posting there. Right. Okay. And now on the external website, you don't need to go to Reba Jobs or AJ Jobs. Sorry, guys. but you Design know, Jobs. On. Well, they've got a good exposure for now, but but Dizine, <laughs> you've charging two hundred pound. I'm coming for you because I'm gonna do. We're gonna do Dizine jobs for free. All right, Dizine, call me. But until then, I'm coming for you. Right, <laughs> and so so why pay for two uh, this two hundred? You can do that, but there's there's two things to it. I can give you the scope for you to advertise. You can do that today, but you need to show there needs to be, and especially now more than ever, a big shift on showing culture and exposing each other. And, and when I say exposing, showcasing the amazing things you do. And I think that's going to help. So, okay, you can post on the architecture social, but th there's a few things we disrupt. So we're going to get rid of all the job boards, but architectural practices need to open up. Okay, so not the word exposed, open up's the thing. So we need to start talking about what you offer, the culture there, okay? You need to say, what is it like to work in your architectural practice? You need to start thinking about um, diversity in an architectural practice. You need to think about the gender the pay gap and you need to start talking about openly addressing them. You need to start showing your benefits on, on your website. I mean, mm. Hawkins branded a really good video where you saw inside the studio culture there was a video and you know everyone was in the studio doing all the cool stuff and i remember watching that and going oh, maybe i should quit recruitment and go back because that video was so good 
And I think that's like really helpful. And the other thing is everyone needs to, uh, like we said, open up and engage with the community. So it's not just about just posting a job ad anymore Mm -hmm. and going, Oh, I didn't get many people apply to it. It's like, you've got to go the extra level right now. So, so a good example. So, and I challenge you. So anyone listening, right. You can sign up to the architecture social for free, but if you post, if you engaged in the community, right. And you maybe offered a little bit of advice to a part one, or you showcase your architectural projects there. And maybe you did like a show and tell to the students, you came on and went, okay, this is my new scheme. This is what we've done. This is what it was like. This is what was exciting. Oh, and maybe then you even showcase what it was like to work in your office, right? Mm-hmm. If you do that and then post your job application next to, uh, so your job, your job ads next to your show and tell, next to your projects, next to all that, that is what's going to get you so many amazing, talented people to apply, right? Not spending 400 quid on a job board that just posts your thing. Do you know, it's all gone. Cause basically all them and, old. And, and also, I mean, I suppose I'm, I'm always critical of the, the, the kind of job postings that we see from architects. Again, it's, just, it's another marketing activity really. And you often get, they're very dry. They don't really explain much. You don't know who the practice is or you get the kind of, we are hiring Instagram post. That's the other classic mm-hmm. Well, we were talking just before about um, an advert which was posted by an architectural practice, which was very, um, which alienated the architectural community. And, you know, the point is you can't write down. uh, It might have been a really big architectural practice with a really big, like, famous architect, (laughs) which was looking for a a personal assistant to to make fancy dress. You'll find out if you look online. Um, (laughs) <laughs> and we know, uh, you know, it's... Yeah, we know. But you can't do that anymore because what you've got to do is you. there's ads are written in a top-down way, right? And yeah. so there's so many, it goes, we are, so most, most uh, ads are written like, we are the amazing architectural practice who have done X, Y, Z. To work for us, you need to have eight years revit, seven years residential. You need to do this and this and that. You need to do this. You need to have this. And it's the total wrong way of writing ads. The other way should be like, are you ambitious? Are you an architect that's done uh, a few years of experience and you want to go to the next level? We are an amazing architectural practice, which has gone strength by strength. We're dynamic. We're, we're interested in bleeding edge technology. And we want forward thinking people to drive the architectural practice forward. Is this for you? If so, message us. If you write that, how exciting did that sound compared to... Eight years Revit, please. Um, ex- <laughs> eight, 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 you know, and if you don't have Revit, we're not going to reply. So it's like you, you've got to really think about the narrative that's really going to drive people forward. And wacky spending 600 quid and putting an ad on a Reba Jobs is going to be, you're going to get free applications if you're lucky. And probably one of them will be the guy that applied for everything. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, so, this is, so how do we disrupt recruitment? So it's a two-way thing. I will build a platform for it, for it. And so, like, even now, I work at McDonald's Company. They're so, so good to me. I do my nine to six there, right? The architectural social I do with my outside of hours, it's a project. And so, if you want something specific through McDonald's Company, you could come to me and I would find that BIM manager, okay? But if you're looking for a junior or you want to engage or you want to build up your brand, the architectural social is the community platform for it. So, it's a challenge. So I've made the space. There's 3,500 people there for it. It's a place where you can build up your brand. You can build up your brand there. You can build it up on your website. You can build it up by um, your own employees. They're going to be ambassadors for your own brand. Mm. And so how you disrupt recruitment is champion in the awesome things you do. So you can showcase your projects on the social. You can do all that stuff. um, And I will get people there. So I will rally up the crowd. We've got 3,500 people, but it's a stage. And I can be the guy with the mic going, on to the stage next. (laughs) It's Rian's practice. 
but it's like a talent. It's like when you're there, I can help you get the most out of it. And I can, and I can, I can advise on what you should say. So I'm like, Rian, on when you're on stage, you're going to say this is that you're going to talk about your gender ba- balance. You're going to talk about how you've helped people through mm. difficult times. The fact that you've got like fantastic, you got, you got some, the fantastic female architects, you've got fantastic male architects, you've got LGBTQ, you're looking after people, you're doing diverse projects, you're, commu- you're building back in the community, you have a fruit bowl, you have all this stuff, you know, we can do all that. But if you're not interested in it, people notice. And so it's a two-way thing. So part of it, and this is what, this is the beauty of it here, it's not just the, it's, it's kind of like therapy or anything else, right? At first, you think the problem's the world. You're like, the world is stressful, the world is this and that. And then if, you've, if ever anyone's been into therapy, um, then what you realize is that the way you change the world is through you. Yeah. So it's kind of like you have to stop drinking less alcohol to kind of get yourself into control so you can make the world a better place. And and so the way we disrupt recruitment is so I will help bash down a lot of the doors. I, trust me, anyone there, you sign up to the Architects of Social, I will let you advertise all your jobs there for free. And if you say, this, we'll call it Business of Architects, you mentioned this podcast as well, you get extra special treatment. I'll, I'll, absolutely, I'll, I'll, absolutely. We'll, we'll do something <laughs> there, but it's going to be a two-way thing and you've got to be really open to changing, you know? Oh, okay, so it's like, it's like, it's like anyone watch Gordon Ramsay's Kitchen Nightmares? I mean, for... I'm not going to throw a pan at you, but you know, when some businesses, they go, Rian, we're on the verge of bankruptcy. We want to change. And then Gordon comes in and he's like, you got to get rid of all this. And this is bad. And they're like, "Uh, no, we've been doing that for years. Okay. You've got got to be open to change. And so I'm open to change. I'm open for doing the old school recruitment, which works. And the bit I'm up for disrupting is, is that, you no longer have to pay for a job board. You can do it for free. You can post your events for free. You can post your projects for free. So it's the perfect place for you to practice office culture. And that's what it is because your brand is everything. So about the brand, okay, your brand is key. If you develop the perception, the public perception of architectural practices to be a welcoming and supportive environment, you will attract more talent. You will pay recruitment consultants less and you will use them when they need it and when it's important for strategic stuff. If you build up the brand perception of your architectural practice because you look after people, you champion amazing design, you're flexible and you're, you're an exciting place to work, those part twos, those part threes, they will all come flying and you're going to get people that want to work for you. You're going to get people that will do the extra hour. You will no longer have to impose overtime because when a deadline comes, you'll have the people that want to help you out. But it really starts from that. And it really starts on working on the innards because you can't um, dress up something if it's not there. There's an analogy I want to use with glitter. and Polish a turd. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you can't polish a turd. If a turd's a turd, right? But if you work all that out yeah, and then you champion it and then you showcase it on a place with the Arctic Social, whether you can engage in the community, you will get a lot of candidates. Amazing. So, yeah, there you go. That's how we start. I love it. I love it. T- tell me a little bit more about the architecture social. Like, what is it? How did you come about doing it? Where did it start? Was it Was it purely for this purpose or... Good question. It's, it's like, do you know, like in Slumdog Millionaire, where over the cool guy's life, he like gets loads of lessons everywhere. And then at the end, it all works out to a million quid. It didn't yeah. quite work out to a million quid for me, but it, what it did is the social. So it's like, it was from a combination of working in the industry mm. and, and recruitment. And also because I was put on furlough. So I was on furlough and and in march because it basically the brakes came on the pandemic came and and you got to remember that architectural practices were thinking oh my gosh we're gonna have to shut down the offices and so for most architectural practices the idea of um uh, you know not working in the office and working remotely was just like mind blowing it was like Mm. oh my gosh how are we gonna survive so everyone locked up and so while mcdonald company they, they'd be very good to me. I was on furlough. I was on furlough. And for the first month, it was quite nice um, getting, you know, 
drinking wine and watching Netflix. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> but then after a month, I really, seriously, I kind of, you know, we're all studying architecture for a reason. You've got to be creative. You've got to keep the juices flowing. Yeah. And after a month, I just felt like my brain was turning into a red wine. Do you know what I mean? It's just like, I'm like, this is not good. And so I needed a creative outlet and I needed to, I tried to think about um, a few of the ideas we talked about here. So you know what I'm on about? I get so people talking to me in terms of recruitment, asking advice. And rather than spending a minute or two on the phone and speaking to a part one or part two and going, I can't really help that much because I'm not working right now, but you should do this and this for your CV. It was kind of like, how can I help people on a bigger scale? Or how can we make an environment where people can talk? And that's one of the biggest challenges I have is still kind of engineering the environment for everyone to talk openly because not a lot of people are used to sharing openly. Yeah. Um, and, and so that's a constant challenge. But so what I thought is rather than spending one or two minutes on the phone with you and then one or two minutes on the phone with someone else and not really giving proper advice and guidance, I was like, wouldn't it be awesome to kind of build a platform where we can talk about how someone who's a part one or part two in particular can get a job? And so then I found the platform, which um, the Architecture Social has built, which is the Mighty Networks. And I thought that was really cool because I liked the, the community aspect. And then, like you said, in the Slumdog Millionaire things, my, my brain started going, ding, 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 ding. And I was like, wow, okay. So not just like helping part ones and part twos and having, I was like, there could be amazing community and dialogue. And there was, there, it was like the opportunity to post CVs on there and for CVs and portfolios to be shared in a safe space for constructive criticism. So I would talk there and now we've got people that will get involved and we've had amazing people from the industry. For instance, Chris Hartis, who's a, who was design director at Squires and Partners. And now he's um, he's a design, he was a director at Squires and Partners. Now he's a design director at Modulus. And he was spent a lot of time helping people. So you had so you had someone like from my perspective, so worked in recruitment, then you've got people that would hire people from before. So it was a really like rich place for everyone to share ideas. And what's happened is, is then, and this is great. So now it was originally much more student focused, but um, now there's a lot more architects on there. There's a lot more um, people that are, for instance, um, maybe a little bit forgotten as well. So like a really good example is I can think of a lot of fantastic single mothers on there. And, you know, a lot of people that are, like you say, contracting on their own, or yeah. there are people that are maybe worked in the UK, but it was, we've got amazing American architects and everything. So it's really awesome. So that suddenly there's like this melting pot of everyone in different backgrounds at different stages, part ones, you know, if people have worked in the industry, all talking and all communicating. And so while the core of it is always at first to help students, it then kind of brought me to the bigger picture where I'm like, well, why can't employee, employers, yeah, employers, talk to employees, which is kind of a bit like um, a crazy idea because there's a lot of people in, I'm sure, in recruitment businesses which are like, why would you let them speak with each other? Because that's how we generate fees. And I'm like, well, that's not true. Um, an architectural practice is going to look for a part one or part two. Um, anyway, so why not give an awesome environment where someone can, you know, a, a, a part one can um, do up their CV, have an amazing kick-ass CV, and then apply to an employer that they yeah. see in there. Yeah, so and they've already might have built the relationship in that in that space in the first place, and they know. And like you say, if a, if a company's doing a good job of, you know, displaying their culture and how they work, then fantastic. It kind of yeah. also start attracting the right talent. Yeah, and I think the other bit that I like to do as well is that I, I like kind of, I guess, inject a little bit of my own personality into it. And I want everyone to inject their own personality. And what it's getting to the point now where I, slowly I'm almost at the point where I can step back, which is amazing because I it, I really don't want it to be the Steve Drew show. And I remember you laughed at this because I was looking at like my um my YouTube feed the other day. And you know when it's like you've always got the pictures of yourself on there, like like a YouTuber. And I was like, I'm so sick of seeing me. Yeah, I was like, I'm so sick of seeing me. That one, that's uh, that's, that's the YouTube, that's the YouTube thumbnail. Yeah, like that, right? I'm so sick of seeing me. And so right, right now, I mean, um, what we're trying to do is get more and more architectural practices to showcase their work to the students because that would be cool, like a show and tell. Yeah. So showcasing the project, how you came about it, what you would do. And, and that's actually a really good marketing piece for an architectural practice. 
Okay. Maybe it's not going to win you work with a developer, but it will win you more people that are going to apply to your practice because they will see an insight. They will get a sense of you and you're going to get more exposure. So that's, um, it's an amazing place to build up um, brand perception. And, Mm -hmm. and that's why I think that that's what I'm trying to do. The issue is real is that because it's never been done before and because I'm working um, full time, it's really hard <laughs> to, to communicate it. So, so anyone listening, uh, you can get involved there and we can, you're on there as well. And I think that um, over time, I think it's going to get more and more momentum. I think on average about a hundred people join a week now. So it's getting Amazing. big. Fantastic. Yeah. Do, uh, on the, uh, this idea of kind of digital networks and online networks and recruitment, do you think we're going to start seeing a situation where we're going to be able to have like, you know, architects in the UK employing architects in the U S and then the, the two never actually physically meet. Is that possible? Is that happening? It's getting closer. I'm still, I guess I want to say the jaded side of me, but like, look in recruitment, if you came up to me a year, a year ago before pandemic and you said, Steve, I'm looking for a part-time role remote. I would have said, don't don't waste your time on me my friend you keep looking but that don't exist right because all well, that, my that's, fight- that's, that's so interesting because when i you know back in 2008 my desire always was to have a remote position and i looked and i looked and i remember going to recruitment agencies i said if there's anything that allows me to be remote where i can have a bit of freedom, what were you told just you were like, like never heard of it yeah and so that's, be- that's 12 years ago that was like that was just like nope never heard of it and i was like but, they're, but, they're, but people were doing it and that was you know Again, it's amazing it's taken this long for it to... Yeah, and yeah, so, so that's a really good point you raised. So what, it was, what, 2020 last year? So it's 11 years, nothing changed. And I think now it's eased up. And so this is the one blessing of this awful pandemic. I know it's mm-hmm. taken lives, that's awful. What has been interesting, though, is the side effect. It's been a massive culture shock, right? And it's what's in... And, but there's been advantages to it. So the really savvy... Uh, employers are going to be people that have gone well rather than it being a nightmare suddenly there's a chance here to free up our massive office which is floor plans you know and we can we can save costs and and so i know so many directors which are loving the current environment because they're like steve i don't have to spend an hour and a half you know and travel into a design meeting to kind of twiddle my thumbs well you know and that it's like i'll just load up the zoom and so they're much more productive. And so I think there's a lot of good things that can come from it, from the companies that embrace it. So I do think with your analogy of someone in the UK and US, in theory, I see that more on the parametric side or something. Right. But you, of course, you've got kind of UK building regulations and stuff. Where I tell you what are quite forward thinking is that I do a lot of work with one or two really like emergent technology companies in mm-hmm. BIM. And so they were doing remote working before the pandemic because they, you know, it's all about BIM models and it's all about how you facilitate BIM models. And, and so those kind of like, they almost, they almost remind me. So these forward thinking BIM companies, it reminds me a little bit of like what Silicon Valley might be. So they were, the, in my head, they were quite cool because they were before the pandemic working remote and you would tell them an architect the role and they were like, that you're dreaming. I'm like, no, seriously, you can work at home. Um, but what I think we'll see is that most architectural practices now will have to have a level of flexibility. And it's even like where I work now, I think, whereas, I mean, I used to lead a team and in recruitment, I still lead a team, but I used to lead a team physically. And I was under the thing of like, as a team leader, I need to go in so that I make sure that no one is kind of messing around. Not, I mean, I do have good staff but you know it's like you got to keep an eye on the crew and all this stuff and i think yep. now that that's completely changed that you can work remotely and um a good example is is that i've done as much recruitment in january february this year as i was doing um in non-pandemic and and that and that's too purely just about adapting to how we all perform so to answer your question there's going to be a massive shift there's going to be i think um demands of working like part-time remotely and um, working remotely half of the week or something or two thirds of the week or one third of the week is going to be um are we going to see more and more of that and i think that the employers that are more flexible to it are going to get the best candidates 
And I think that it's a bit like, it's a bit like an architectural practice pushing away the inevitable with BIM. Okay. The quicker you deal with it, the better you can get on top of it and the further you go. And I think any employers now who want to build up a culture and they want to look at um, making them stand out in the market and getting the person that is outstanding. Hey, if you're flexible right now, you'll get the, the dream candidate. I mean, a good example is like um, mothers that return to work or anything like that, single moms or anything like that, you know, where you've got, we're talking about amazing people. And before it would be difficult for someone who's got a child to go into the office, yeah. because, but they've got this amazing skill. And, and now suddenly from being slightly flexible, you can have that person. Mm. And a, a really good example is that there was a BIM manager I worked with many years ago, uh, an architectural practice, um, and they they were really flexible with, uh, well, I can say, I'll tell you, say the name because it is a good thing. So Avanti Architects, they hired someone and they were really, really flexible with um, this, um, this BIM manager being able to take up their kids in the morning and go to work a bit later and finish in a bit earlier, but then clocking on for an hour at home. And so they got this amazing, um, this amazing person to do the job. Whereas if you were really brutal about, you've got to be there nine to six, you wouldn't have got them, you know? So I think that's a really good example of how to attract the best people. And I think that more and more people will be requiring this flexibility. Fantastic. Amazing. So what's the, what's, what's your plan for the rest of 2021 with uh, the architecture social? So we'll see. We'll have, we, so we'll see. Let's change the way of recruitment. So, I mean, anyone there, I'm interested in any practices that um, are fed up with the status quo. Uh, anyone that wants to kind of recruit in a different way, anyone that wants to showcase their architectural practice to the community, you can sign up now. It sounds like an infomercial. You can sign up now, but you, you can sign up now and you can go to the Architects of Social and drop me a message and uh, we can see and we can you can do whatever you want. It's Cedric Price's fun palace is the analogy I use. We will make it. We will make it. And uh, my other plan is in terms of like, um, traditional recruitment. I love doing the tricky roles. I love doing the strategic roles. Um, last week, I helped find a BIM manager for a large architectural practice. It was a very, very strategic role. That's what I enjoy in terms of McDonald and company. And that bit of recruitment is not going to change, but let's change the, the rest of it. I mean, so for me, let's build up your architectural practices brand. Let's, let's do show and tell us with projects. Why don't you come to the architecture social and why don't you ta give a little a workshop tutorial with, with some part ones and part twos? I'll help you do it. You'll get massive, um, you'll get massive kudos. You'll get probably um, some students which are going to remember you for the rest of their life because you know what it's like. You remember, don't you, when you're in uni and the employer comes and and that's so that's the kind of stuff I want to do. So I re so this year I want to work with more architectural practices to get them more exposure to the architectural community. I will continue to help the architectural community. And in terms of good old school recruitment, you can um, you can find me doing exactly what I've said and you can refer to this podcast and hold me on the fees, can't you? Because I told you them all now. Love it. I love it. Brilliant. Stephen, I think that's a perfect place for us to conclude, but thank you so much for that. My pleasure. In-depth whirlwind tour of recruitment and how you are stirring the pot and disrupting it and you know i wish you all the best with the architecture social i've been on the platform and had a look around it's absolutely fantastic you're oh, you're making a you. you're, you're 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 garnering a lot of support from you know really interesting architects and students and you know i think what you're doing is fantastic so thank going. you love it